Hello and welcome. I need to wait 20 odd seconds so I know if I'm live or not. Soon as you can hear me, say hello in the chat. There are so many of you in the chat. Hello to each and every one of you. Um, I saw a comment from Stephen who said, is it worth the extra time? Give me more information. I would love to hear that. What else have we got? Excellent. You can hear me. Wonderful. Do we have any more questions before we even get going? <laughs> Maybe not. Right. In which case we will hair off and get going. So hello officially. I'm guessing most of you know me by now, but if not, I'm Elaine Giles, longtime computer trainer, podcast host, YouTuber and shorts creator. First one the other day. Uh, so I use all types of apps, all the Affinity apps, Scrivener, Office, Creative Cloud at times, you name it, I use it, love my tech. Right, we're broadcasting in 1080p, make sure that you are receiving in 1080p. While you are fixing that in the cog in the lower right hand corner, there's a like button. We love the like button. There's also a subscribe. So uh, I suggest you hit subscribe. That way you can be notified when we go live. There's a, there's a little notification bell as well. So you wouldn't want to miss that. Right. Uh, the session tonight, I'm using a Mac. Everything is identical except the final demo. Um, I have had a quick look on Windows to see if the final demo is doable in Windows. Um, Mike's with me as well at the moment, if you want to say hello. My hello. Just, my trusty assistant. And uh, neither of us know if it is or not. But we'll show you what the Mac can do and then you can tell us if Windows can do it. That'd be a good way to go, wouldn't it? So we've got tons to cover. But this is what we're covering. So, yes, that, that's a bit of a wordy slide, isn't it? Um, Pre-production, because... Church newsletters are different from other newsletters in terms of where the content comes from and if you ever get your hands on it. And if you create a church newsletter, you'll know exactly what I mean. So I've got some pre-production considerations and then how to start strong. I'm going to show you a file that is almost what, what we sent out for our church at the weekend. It's Easter Sunday. Um, and then we'll recreate it. We might simplify a bit because our situation is slightly complicated. We have two churches. We used to have three. It was even more complicated. So when it comes to the mass times, we've got two churches and two completely different schedules. But we will look at what we've got and then I will recreate it with creating a new file. We'll add some grids, guidelines, baseline grid, master pages and content pages later. Um, I will take you through creating a cover. Um, the cover I'm creating is quite highly designed. That's one of the differences because when it's printed, you don't want it to cost a fortune. So we'll think about that. Uh, liturgical information on the cover. Oh, we get so many complaints if that's wrong. So, so we have to pay very careful attention to that. Then we've got the actual content. So reflections, readings, prayers and how to cheat. And I've just explained why to cheat, because people promise stuff and you never see it. Right. Then there's the general content itself, which probably changes every week. And then how to generate a table of contents, but not a standard table of contents. It's a newsletter. It's not Vogue. So you don't particularly want everything that's in your newsletter in your table of contents. You need to create a selective table of contents, which is exactly what we'll do. And then we will create the final output. And then we'll do the magic with the Mac side and see if we can replicate it in the PC. You, of course, will have questions. There's two things you can do to help. Do put a cue at the beginning of a question. That way we know it's a question. And secondly, provide a little bit of context. So if you're talking about a dialogue box, tell me which dialogue box. Because if I answer 20 minutes later, I'm not going to have a clue which dialogue box. And the other thing is we have a delay with YouTube. So... YouTube makes me wait at least 25, 30 seconds, and by which time I could have changed the context. So do put some context in. We will also have a, a Q&A at the end, which usually degenerates into just a, a rare old chat, but we do have fun. So that's the plan. That is the plan. So designing a church newsletter in Affinity Publisher, why am I talking about this? Although our church newsletter is actually designed, when I say designed, <laughs> is created in Microsoft Publisher, that's just historic. I, I've been trying for a while to get them converted and they're actually sold on the idea of using Affinity Publisher. The problem was 
the pandemic hit and I couldn't go in to do the training. Um, and that's been carrying on ever since. So at some point, we will probably change this into Affinity Publisher. So that's why what you're about to see tonight isn't actually the newsletter that went out because the newsletter that went out is in Microsoft Publisher. So first things first, pre-production considerations. These are going to change depending on your specific circumstances. The size of the audience, the most important thing, of course, the budget. How are you producing this? Also, you're not just the size of your audience, but your actual audience. Um, your audience will dictate the tone. Your budget will dis dictate the number of pages. Uh, sometimes practicality dictates the number of pages. In our circumstance, before the pandemic, the newsletter was either four A5 sides of paper, so one sheet of A4 folded in half, or two sheets of A4 folded in half. Um, Post-pandemic, 16 pages, 24 pages, because people have got used to it. There's not much ad additional cost, if any, to producing digital output. So therefore, once the newsletter became sign up and we'll, we'll email it to you, it could be much longer. Then there's a point I mentioned about where the content's coming from, because everyone is busy. They will promise content. It will never appear. But there's a dirty hack for that. And I know what it is. And I'm going to share it with you. Then there's the actual distribution. So are you printing it? Is it digitally distributed? Is it both? Um, and the one thing that I can definitely share is some places for appropriate stock imagery. Um, you, it's better if you can use stock imagery without having attributions all over it and whatever. So here's just a few stock image sites. And I've already pre-filtered these for church assets. So you can see there's a whole range and they're all different tones. I mean, I can imagine if I tried putting one of these in our church newsletter, the priest would probably faint. Um, some of them, I would say, are quite um, worshipful and very American. And I, I love that. But no, it wouldn't work in our newsletter. But this one is free pick. And I'm showing you this one. This isn't one I use. Um, the attribution that's required, it works great in digital, but in print, it's, it's a bit long. Um, but I've used this one as a demonstration just to show you that the, our newsletter cover, which you can find at ourparishes.church if you want to see it, use that one this weekend. Now, I don't actually design the newsletter. I created the template. What I do with the newsletter is the proofreading and the fixing of the technical issues um, when pages need, you know, text boxes need to be linked and they're not linked and the text isn't flowing and that kind of stuff. But that's the one we actually used. But some of the others that I do think have got a wide range to choose from, there is Stockio. So Stockio.com. All of these links are already in the description. And if you're live with us in the chat, Mike is putting them in there now. Um, another one is SVG clip art because this scales fantastically well. You're not stuck with pixelated images that look like a, an icon and that you have made much, much bigger. So there's a lot available in there as well. Um, what was the other one? This one was stocksnap.io. All of these seem to be different collections. Usually you get a little bit of an overlap. Most of these seem to be different that I've put in there. Uh, the other one is Pixabay. Obviously, we all use Pixabay. Uh, I think last year we had that one. Um, I, I remember it. So I don't I don't pick these, but I do remember that one. So these are the kind of images you've got. The high quality, they will print fantastically well. They'll work in, in digital. Um, Pix, uh, Pixabay and Pexels are probably the most popular two, I would think. I've added a couple of weird ones in. So one is Heritage Library. Uh, all of this is like aged clip art and stock imagery. So may be relevant for church newsletters. And the other two, definitely weird, but, you know, sometimes every now and then, if you want to say our newsletter is available on a device, then you can use these stock images to generate the picture of your newsletter on a device. And they're totally free. So this is mockup.photos, cut it. And the other one that is utterly amazing is shots.so. So while those last three are not exactly bang on point, they can certainly supplement images that you use. So finally, I can close all of those because I've had all of those open waiting to get going. Right. So why aren't you moving? There's always one, isn't there? There we go. 
So how do you start strong? Well, I'm talking in terms of size and layout. So if you are literally just starting this journey, you'll need to think of this in relation to the budget and any other constraints that you may have. But in terms, in technical terms, once you've got your size decided, then it's just a matter of choosing a layout. You may already have a template, but if not, that's not a problem because you'll be in a great position to create one by the end of the session. So I'm going to take you through what we'll be recreating and then we'll actually start and we will do it. So move into there. I've already got it open and I actually have the file open. And I do wish that worked, but it doesn't. When you command and tab now on a Mac, it doesn't take you to the file. You've got to do other things. So this is broadly what our newsletter looks like, or it would do if I was left alone. <laughs> they've toned it down a bit. Um, they've toned it down a bit in terms of the design. They wanted the text bigger. And that, that's another constraint you've got. Um, the audience, it, it, you know, it needs to be 12 point, not 11, that kind of thing. But ballpark, this is what I would create. So um, masthead at the top, a liturgical date underneath. So it's Easter Sunday. Sometimes that is saying St. Peter and St. Paul or whatever. We usually do put the date on it. And the A in brackets is to do with the year. So there is an A, B or C year in the Catholic calendar. Um, and again, if that's wrong, we hear about it because people, you know, people who don't come off and may come at Easter and they may have a missile with them and they may be looking for the order of service and they need to know what year it is because there would be three orders of service for Easter Sunday, A, B and C. So that's why that needs to be on there. At the bottom, we've chosen to put um, legality information. So one of the things we would need to put on is that the diocese of which our church is part is a registered charity. So that has to go on there. Um, I've changed the addresses. <laughs> Keep the innocent out of it. Um, but we uh, we do put on it who the parish priest is. We also have a retired priest and a deacon. So that's on there as well, usually. And the website at the bottom. The number of people who cannot remember the website is frightening. So it's always worth having that front and centre on the front. The other thing that we've chosen to put on the front, and this was historic um, when I joined the church, the newsletter they had, which they were looking to to have a makeover, which is what this is, um, they had this week's readings on the front. So we kept that on the front. Now, normally with ours, we would have that photo much smaller. So the bottom half would just be completely plain. But seeing as though I can do what I like with this demo, I've gone large. So I just have a box at the back and then I have a table on the top of it with that information in. Right. The rest of it, some bits are blank, um, but I've put in enough information. So I'm just going to take that into the view mode so you're not bombarded with columns and things. The rest of it ballpark is what we have. So we have our contact details on the left. And again, that is there in every issue. And we still get mails to the wrong mail. If you're wondering how we get them, if it's the wrong mail, we have more than one mail. So one's an admin mail that's not used. I use it. Um, if a mail comes to that, I have to forward it on. So we do put the email and the website again in there. We also then have next week's readings underneath. So if people are getting ready for the following week. We actually have that on the inside. This that you're looking at is a table of contents, which is the selective table of contents. It is not including everything. Uh, then we have a reflection. Now, that is something that is written by somebody else. So this is one of the, the problems you would have if somebody else is supposed to be writing the reflection and it doesn't appear. Then it's your job to write it, which can be very frustrating and confusing because you're in, you're, you're, it's easier to lay something out if you didn't write it. If you have to stop in the middle of the layout to write something, your, your brain is pulled in two different directions. So I, I would probably close it down. And, and do the other part and then go back to it. But I find that very frustrating. Right. The next bit uh, is the bidding prayers. Uh, and we've got some wrap on that. So I'll show you how to do all of that. I've put in a couple of proper stories and the rest of it is the quick brown fox. But the parish news. So we have a heading for the parish news. And then within that, we have individual stories. You could, if you wanted, split that up over two columns and think that that is easier to read. 
I decided not to do that purely because the font is bigger than I would normally have it based on feedback from the readers. It's like I can't see it. I need more than my reading glasses. So we've gone for a slightly bigger font, which means it probably works better um, in one column than two. It would probably break up very strangely in two. And the next one is for advertising a coffee morning and more important stories. And finally, uh, the bane of my life, the mass times. <laughs> right. The mass times, because this is printed out, um, it needs to be that way. It needs to be rotated. But obviously, when I'm creating it, I don't want to look at it like that. So how do I sort all of that out? And that is what we're going to do. You can see at the top I've got a master page. Um, I haven't got any more master pages. Everything's hanging off that one at the moment. But I will create multiple ones and you will see why. So just before we get going, do we have any questions, Mike? No, no questions. OK, is everybody still chatting? Or are they all quiet? They're all quiet. Oh, they're all quiet. Like they're at church, you mean? Mm. <laughs> right. OK, so we will create the file. So I'm just going to file a new. If you have seen my short, you'll know that there's three ways to create a new file. If not, go watch my, my short. Um, but what I, I'm, I'm doing here, a replica of what I've got. So for me, it's A5. So I'm working through the presets. If I had a template, obviously I would go to the templates. So if like my MacBytes bingo, I've already got a template, then I would do that. But at the moment, I'm creating this from scratch. So um, at this point, you need to make decisions as to well, what size it is. Some go for A4, some go for A5. We do have a photocopier that's amazing. It's about the size of our kitchen and it staples, it folds, it cooks your breakfast. It's fabulous. So we can use A5, but print to A4 and it will fold it in half and staple it. Um, if you're not so fortunate, it's probably easier to go A4 and, and, and staple it at the side. But you will probably have some idea as to what your situation is regarding that. So I'm sticking with A5. I am creating a default master because I'm going to look at the master pages much later. Um, I probably don't need it at 300 DPI, but it seems to be 300 DPI. I'm sure I changed it to 144. But never mind, I'll go in and change it to 144, which is there. Why 144? Well, if I'm putting it on a website, I want it to be retina. I want it to look decent in retina. So that's twice what you normally have at 72 DPI. Then I've got the pages. So do I want facing pages? Um, for printing, it's probably a good idea to have fa uh, facing pages, but... Your situation will vary depending on how you are outputting this. But in terms of knowing what goes where, I'm going for facing pages because that's what it would look like. Ours would look like printed out. So facing pages, starting having them arranged horizontally and starting on the right and eight pages. So if we're looking at this one behind that we're working with, the cover will be on its own. The mass times will be on its own. And then you've got a double page spread, three of them in the middle. Um, what colour are you working to? Now, I have already had questions about this saying that, you know, when it's printed, it's got to be printed grayscale. Ours is printed grayscale. I don't design it in grayscale, though. So you can just print to a grayscale printer and it will convert it for you. Why would you do that if that's your output? Well, if you want to have a digital output from the same file, the PDF would automatically be colour and the printed output would automatically be grayscale. So I don't see the point in, in having two and trying to keep two running alongside each other. If you find that the images are not acceptable in your with your printer, then you could do something with each individual image. But I've never had that problem, even with dark images. So if you have, put that in the chat, put it in a comment and let me know. Right. So I'm going to leave that alone. I'm then going to go and look at the margins. Now, I don't want the margins anything like as big as this. I know I can get away with 10 millimetres, but I want to leave 15 at the bottom so I can squeeze in a page number and not have it cut off. Your mileage may vary here because it's going to depend on your printer. There is a thing called a non-printable area. Uh, I think on my printer, it's about five millimetres. It's a lot better than it used to be. It used to be about an inch. 
Um, it just depends on the printer. So I know that there, that's a safe area as far as I'm concerned. Everything will print out properly. I don't need a bleed because I'm not sending it to print. So it just won't have a bleed. And at that point, I can create the file. We do have a question. We have a question. Away you go. Relevant. Uh, Stephen says, I would have thought that 72 was not sufficiently high quality for the contents of the page to be interactive. Am I mistaken? Um, depends on, on what device you're looking at it on. I would stick to at least 144. I may even go to 300 because the printer can print out at 300. I think it tops out at 600 DPI. Uh, obviously, it costs more to print that depending on the content so you'd have to weigh that up um digitally 144 is fine i wouldn't use 72 anymore um even phones have like a retina display so if you do print it out or you make a file at 72 you're going to find that it is more blurry another thing to consider is there's no point at the very beginning starting off with a, you know, a ropey set of settings because you're going to compress this later. So every week when I've got the newsletter, I also do the proofreading. So before it gets put on the website, I'm doing the proofreading. Things like um, when you get content from other people, you know, the ones who insist that it's correct to put two spaces after a full stop. Those people, Mike, mm. it's not. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, it can send your alignment way out um, but people do and it's copied and pasted in there another issue we have is stuff that's copied and pasted from emails that got that's got weird characters in it you cannot see these characters it's just like why can't i backspace um, but if you copy the text and you paste it into a text editor you see all the weird characters so that's my job to make sure that the text is actually syntactically correct so um at that point, I, I don't think I w would be putting stuff in because I'd be looking at the file and I'd be thinking, you know, I've got to compress this and I know that the quality of the images is going to be reduced and I don't want them reduced like twice. I don't want to be putting it in and changing it and taking it down. That's the last job. The last job is to get it the right size, a size that people aren't complaining that it's taking too long to download to their device. So, no, I wouldn't work at 72. Never. Have we got anything else? Uh, no. <laughs> See, it. pandemonium is agreeing with the double space. I actually have a saved search for that just to make sure. And sometimes in things like Outlook, you if you copy and paste from Outlook, you can get 36 spaces. And the 36 spaces is the, it's literally copied the space to the end of the line and then it, it's pasted it in. It's hideous to try and deal with it. So what I do, um, I mean, I won't demonstrate that, but what I do is if the story is like, this is just wrong, this is badly, badly wrong, then what I do with it is take it out to a text editor and have a look at it in there. And then I can see all these weird characters. And it's not always the same weird character. But once you get rid of these weird characters, the text just becomes far more pliable to you wrapping it, moving it. And it just looks right. You've not got these multiple spaces that you can't work with. OK. Right. So uh, what was I heading up next? Oh, I was going to explain, but I'm not going to have the time to go through all of text styles. I will show you the textiles, but I can't go through creating them all because there was a lot of them. But what I will show you is in the file in here, which is the demo file, I will. Uh, I think I can do it with it open, but we'll find out, won't we? We'll find out. Um, you can see in here I've got multiple styles. Now, one thing to mention, I mention this every single time is that I have this set in here to show the hierarchy of the styles and to sort by type. So if yours looks different, that is why. But I love to do that because you can see I have the base style, which is a group style. There are three different types of text styles. There is a group style, which is the plus S. There is a paragraph style, which is the pilcrow. And there is an A, which is a character style. So I have automatically a base style group. You can see that in this new file that I haven't done anything to yet. I still have the base style. When I open that up, I have a collection of styles inside it. So I have my headings, I have numbers, I have bullets and other various things. But going back to this one, I also have, if I close my base style, I have styles for the cover. I have styles for the sidebar. 
I also have in my base styles multiple. I have additional styles that I have created, but my cover styles are for the cover, obviously, and my sidebar styles are for the sidebar on the inside. So you cannot export styles. I can't sit with this file that I've already done and say export those styles. You don't need to because what you can do is import the styles and that's what I'm going to do with them. So there's only a handful, but that's what I'm going to do. So you can see here you've got import, you have no export. So I'm going to go to import and it is going to have a think about it. There is my demo church newsletter and I am going to open that up. And then you get this imported textiles box. Now, how hideous this is, is going to depend on how many clashes you've got and what work you've already done in here. And I've done nothing. That's why I'm importing them now. So it's saying there is an incoming style called body and it's conflicting with an existing style. What do you want to do with it? Now, all of them. I want to replace the existing style, which is the default, if you see. So in the entire list, anything that's clashing is going to get overwritten. I've just said replace it. You can change that if you want to do something else. It gives you all of this information here and you can decide what to do with it. But I am happy overwriting them. Some of them do not have a conflict. So if we look at that one, for instance, it doesn't need renaming or anything like that. It, there is no conflict because it's an it's a new style. It, it doesn't clash with anything that's already there. So luckily for me, because of the way I've done it, I can just import the whole lot. Now, what has happened is over here under the base style, those styles have come in my multiple headings and my cover has come in with its children's styles, issue date and masthead. And so has my sidebar. So all the styles that I need are in there. I will show you what the styles look like as we get going. Right. But at this point, um, let me move these so I can see. Right. OK, so. We've got the file, but we don't have anything to help us in the way of layout. So don't make the mistake of thinking um, I need to think about columns and start working on page one or page two. Go to the master page. I am going to start with just a simple master page and, and then I will end up with more than one master page. But I'm turning back on uh, up here this one, which is the preview, the toggle preview mode. I'm turning it back on so we can see the margins. So the blue lines are representing the margins. What I need to do is to put in here some guides. In fact, they're not actually guides. It's columns I'm looking for. So I put three columns in it, but obviously the gutter is ludicrously large. I have no idea why it's doing that. I think I put five in for mine. Um, I'm not actually putting in columns of text. I just want sometimes something to take up two columns. So be two thirds of the page. Um, and it also helps with the sidebar. So that's what I've put on there. Another thing that I do is turn on the baseline grid. Where on earth the baseline grid? Put it on a different screen. Thank you for that. Now, the baseline grid, you don't really need to use a baseline grid, but it's better if you do. Uh, and it's better if you're going to use a baseline grid to use it from the start. Don't turn the baseline grid on halfway because everything will look terribly wrong. So I use a baseline grid. Uh, you can show the baseline grid, which looks like that. I make it a multiple of four. And because I'm limited in terms of the font size with this. I actually make it quite tiny. So normally I would say eight to 16. So eight would look like that. I was still having problems with that. So I think I made it four, <laughs> which I think is that small. You might as well not bother. But there you go. At least everything will line up. But I can't work with it turned on. So I then turn it off. One thing to consider with the baseline grid. The idea with the baseline grid is if you have text in multiple frames or in multiple columns, it can be fractionally out. So it doesn't line up horizontally across the page. And with a baseline grid, it does. But it can cause complete havoc if you're putting tables in and things like that. The baseline grid can be overridden on a case by case basis. So just to show you, can we actually see that at this point? Uh, yes, we can. 
So if we had a table, there is an option to ignore the baseline grid. So if you've got a table and you've centered everything and it's still not right, it's probably the baseline grid. So in a table, I would choose to ignore the baseline grid. Let me sort out what this table looks like. OK, so we've got that. Come on, away you go. Right. Uh, and then into here, I think. And I don't think I did anything else. Let me have a look. No, no, I think I did. Right. So bear in mind, this is master A and it's applying to all of these pages. So now as I go through here, because I said at the very beginning, use a template, a master page, it did it and it applied the default master page to all the pages. We'll be changing that as we go, but for the moment it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Now we can start with the content. So um, let me flick into here. Right. Creating a cover. Now, this is probably going to be the, the most important page in terms of people picking it up and making off with it, you know, reading it, actually consuming it. But it's also going to be the most important page when it comes to the cost. We tend to put a colour image on it, but it only gets printed out in colour twice a year. So you may have to change the image based on that. Sometimes we have um, like clip art that's just black and white. So lots of things to think about with the cover. So I'll show you what my preference for the cover would be. So I've got an image that I like to the one that you've already seen. Right. So one thing I could do is start with that image. So this is what the image looks like. And it's huge, literally huge. Look at the size of it by comparison to the page. So I'm going to need to crop it in some kind of way and I'm going to need to scale it. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do any of that. So what I'm going to do with that is undo. Get rid of it. Where you go. You're not going away, are you? Oh, all right, then I'll delete you if you insist. Right. What I would do instead, and this will also benefit you when you come to create templates and master pages. Easiest thing to do is to put a picture placeholder on the frame on the page to hold the image. Now you might think, well, that's superfluous. You can just put the image in. Yes, but then I've got to crop it manually. If I put the picture placeholder in and I drag the image into that, then half the work is done for me. Now, it's, it's going to take a couple of seconds because it's so large, but if hopefully it won't die a sad death on me. Although I'm not confident it's just sitting there. Oh, go on. You know you want to. Do we have a question? Well, no. it, it, it's not even thinking about it, is it? No, they're talking about keyboards and typing speeds. Right. OK, then. Mm, that That's not doing very well at all. Why did that not work? Oh, it's opened it in a, in a window of its own, which wasn't what I wanted at all. Let's go back to it and try again. I did drop it in the right place. Another place that you can get stock images from, of course, is the stock panel inside here. Right, so that has dropped it in and it's constrained it to the size of the picture placeholder. You can move it about. So if you would rather have that in the middle, you can move it about. But again, you don't have to recrop it or anything else either. And it's constrained. You also have the ability in here to make it bigger or make it smaller. Obviously, you don't want to make it smaller than the height of the thing, but you can do that if you wish. Right inside here, uh, I always like to show that that is the actual image. If you click on that, you get the blue handles outside the page frame because that's the full image. But the picture frame is constrained to the size it was when you started. So that is what I do with that. Then I added somewhere at the top where I could put. So I'd have it across here. I think that's grey and I have it white. But I'm going to put it there and make sure it snaps to the left. So I've got the red line across, green line up and down and pull that across. Probably not that much. And as I say, I would probably have that white. Are you white now? I think you are. I also put one of these uh, at the bottom and that is because I'm going to be putting text on top of it. But it probably doesn't need to be that wide. I don't think I had it that wide in the original. So I'm going to look where that actually is. And no, it's not that wide. 
so we'll make it a bit narrower but what I will do is put it in the center there and again you can see I've got the red line at the bottom which is indicating the margin and the green line which is indicating the center and now I am ready to put the content on there so this is where my styles come in but I don't think oh I did style I did yes I did I did style the first page so I'm going to put in there what the text was which I think is in our case our parish's newsletter which is obviously way too big and also not the right font. But in the text styles, I had created a group for the styles on the front cover. Now, when I've done this before, people have said, like, well, why are you bothering putting them in a group? What difference does it make? Because they're not the same. So normally the reason that you would put things in a group is if they're applying to the same thing or they look similar. But these these aren't really going to look similar, but I put them in a group because that way I can open them and I know all the cover styles are near each other. So I needed a masthead style for that. And that works nicely. So I can pull that up so it's at the top. It's perfect width and it's lined up properly. Right. So far, so good. Right. I'm going to go back to this one. So I've got the right year, etc. So I'm going to copy that but I'm not going to style it. I'm going to go into here and I am going to put in was it a text frame? Don't think it was. I think it was this. So let's put that in there and what I'm going to do is paste it in as plain text. So what how it styled it, it's the correct font, it's the wrong size. The reason that it's done that is the last style that I used was the masthead so it carries on thinking that's what I want. That gets me constantly because sometimes when I finish making a template, I've used a particular style last. And every time I make a document based on that template, it, it uses that style and it's not the right style. This is not the right style at all. Uh, we had the issue date. That is the right style. So I'll just pull that back and line it up to the right. This is actually um, aligned to the right. The text up here isn't, but this actually is. The trickier bit is the bit at the bottom. So I did have a heading on there that said next week's readings. So I just put some text on it. What on earth are you doing? No, I think it was this text. Right, let's just get that on. This week's readings. Right, and pull that down over this. And again, I'm centering that. Now, at the moment, as I'm looking at that text, that is not centered text, it's left aligned. So I do tend to make sure that it's centered in case I need to make this bigger at some point. And that way it will line up properly. There it is, centered. Right, there's two other elements in here. So I don't know if I've actually got enough room, but we'll, we'll make a bit more room. One is just a simple block of text at the bottom. So if we look at how I've done this, it's just this text at the bottom that is going in a text frame, a standard text frame. So back in here, uh, instead of artistic text, I need a text frame. And that's probably going to be about that big. And I will paste it in. And there we go. Obviously, the tricky part is the table in the middle. Most of what you see on there, apart from the image, would be on a template. I would have this on a template. It wouldn't need editing. This would need editing. The image would need editing and the table would need editing. But the rest of that would not need editing. So that would be on the master page. But we have our readings table to get in there. Now, to put a table in is fairly simple. And it looked like it had what the readings were on the left and the actual readings on the right so people can find them. So I need a table that is two columns and four rows like that. And then I need to put them in. Luckily, uh, I have some that I had earlier. So if you are copying them from somewhere like in here, I mean, they're not the same every week, unfortunately, because you could copy that and paste it. That would be the easy way, wouldn't it? But you can't copy and paste it from a text file or something like that because it shoves all the text in one cell. 
drives me mad. But I have the readings. So I would be looking to put in here first reading. And that's interesting, isn't it? Can't see it. Why can't you see it? It's it picked some kind of text, table body here, and it thinks it's white, which it shouldn't be. So let's make it black. Oh, come on, don't do silly things. What are you doing? Do you need to be bigger? Has it put it behind something? I have no idea what it's doing. Hmm, right. What we'll do, this one's working, so we can copy that. And hopefully if we paste it in, it'll work. I was just going to do it the manual way, but if it's going to be silly, then we'll just paste it. All right, good grief. What happened there? That's, that's massive. <laughs> Don't think it pasted the whole table, did it? Good grief, what's it doing? Oh, not a problem. Why does it always work in rehearsals? I have no idea what that is doing, but it's not right, is it? OK, we'll get rid of the whole thing. We'll start again with it. Oh, no, we've lost the table. Let's go in here. Where's the table? Table. Are you behind that when you should be in front of it? Is that your little issue? I don't trust it. I'm going to get rid of it and I'm going to go in here. It's a standard table and all I did was type some text into it. The one thing I was going to show you was how I managed to get it to look reasonable in terms of where the text actually was. So now I've got the table in here. I'm going to make that bigger so I've got more room. I clearly did some other stuff, didn't I? Right, and move that up. Oh, come on. Now we've got sticky mouse. Where are you? That'll do. And then go and get that. Right. So what I'm going to show you is I have a gap on the left hand side. You will also notice that the text is aligned vertically in the center. Normally, when you create a table, the text is hideously large and it is bang up to the left hand side and to the top. So what I did to make that work is in the tables panel, which is here, it's not the table frame or the stroke and fill. Um, I had the vertical position in here set to centered. And in the cells, I selected all the cells. And what it did look like was where you've got your insets, your insets were zero or 0.44. So I changed them to two and it made it look much better. Those were the only two changes that I made. And now it's lining up. So that was my front cover. Now, as I say, what I did with this when I made the template was then leave two parts of it. No, three parts of it editable. The table was editable. The date was editable and the image was editable. The rest of it doesn't need to be edited. Now, having said that, every now and then it does. So if you change the web address or something like that, then obviously that does need to be changed. All you need to do is change it on the template. So that is our front cover. I will show turning that into a template later. But do we have any questions on that at the moment? We have a couple of questions. OK. Uh, Stephen says, when it's relevant to do so, I wonder, would Elaine help us deal with the problem of how to amend items placed on pages which have specific masters containing frames? The circles at corners are X's. Right, I'm with you. OK, can you make a note of that? And we'll cover that in the Q&A at the end. Yeah. And what else do we have? Tracy says, would it be appropriate to talk about snapping modes in this session or would it be better addressed in an after hours specific section? Uh, to cover snapping, which can be an absolute nightmare because it, it, I mean, it is logical when you understand what it's doing, but understanding what it's doing is tricky. It would probably be better separate because I think in this session, you'd only be using one part of the snapping. And to understand it fully, you need to, to know all the bits of the snapping. So make a note of that as well. Do we have anything else? No. Right. OK, so we have our front cover at that stage all done. Right. The next thing is the content. So um, we have a reflection. So we used to have um, a resident nun at one of our parishes who wrote the reflection. 
Um, once she was no longer able to, then it became, you know, we, we put it on a rota and that's when it starts getting tricky that life gets in the way or people just forget. The readings are easier um, in terms of they are what they are. But we have bidding prayers and the bidding prayers are also written by uh, people from the congregation. So, again, it's not unusual to get to Thursday night when the newsletter needs to be finalised and not have the bidding prayers. Um, so I'm going to show you how to cheat. So basically, this is content, but it's not the con it's not story content where you can just write what you like. You know, if you're writing prayers, it's a better idea if they are to do with the time of year or, or the day. Um, when I was writing the bidding prayers, um, I, I we used to do it about twice a year, two, three times a year. And I used to want to pick Holocaust Memorial Day in January, uh, Remembrance Sunday and one in June. Yeah. And they, they to me were like, I know what I'm writing, but you don't have to worry anymore. You can cheat. Um, I, I'm thinking of showing our parish secretary this. I think she'd probably collapse. So uh, what I've got on these pages, um, I had this sidebar over there that we'll create shortly, but I also had a reflection and our reflection goes on this area here. But I'm leaving that for the table of contents. So I'm putting the reflection over on this side. So when I said I had three columns, but I wasn't particularly going to use them as three columns, this is what I meant. I'd be putting a frame on here. Might not take it full width. I could actually scoot it down a bit, not worried in the slightest what size it actually is, although I did see that go past 100. So 100 millimetres would be nice if we can stop it there. But I'm not concerned about it because I can just pick this up and move it and now it's centred and it's just got a bit of a gap. Um, we tend to do that and that way we can say X number of words and we know it's probably going to fit. But if these, you know, if it's slightly over, if it's 20 or 30 words over, we don't need to worry about it. It will still fit because we've got room. We can extend this sideways. But if it's, if, if it's the right size or short, then we just narrow it down a bit and then it doesn't look like it's short. So just practicalities at that point. Uh, and I had an image over there as well. So I think we, we had it down to about there. But you need to know how to create it, don't you? The cheating that's going on. So what I'm going to bring on is that this is just my page in Notion. And you can see there's the resources that I've shared. And this is how I run the session. So I have all of my um, everything is in here. You know, have you done all this when you've started? There's the snapping modes going in. There you go. That's a follow up for me. So this is just a page in Notion. All right, we've used the resources, so we don't need to worry about those. But you can see I've got three embedded pages here. And it doesn't matter whether you use Notion or Craft or ChatGPT. ChatGPT is $20 a month for the pro version or a free account that you're not guaranteed to have access with. It's, tw it's $8 a month in Notion and it's free with a Craft subscription. And Craft is part of Setup. So I've just used Notion because that's what I've got. But I asked it to write me a reflection. So for that, that's the prompt. So you can see what the prompt is. So I said, write a 400 word reflection for a church newsletter for Easter week. And it wrote it. And I was impressed <laughs> because if I ask the priest to write it, I'll be here till Christmas. He's a busy man. I then asked it, you know, I read it and I thought, that's really nice. Uh, can we have a longer one? So I then asked it to write a 700 word reflection. And it did a grand job. Now, the thing with this is I'm happy with what I've got in here. It never writes the same thing twice, obviously. But I will show you if you've never seen this happen and you're thinking, wow, I would like to do that. It's very straightforward. Oh, good grief. Vivaldi's crashed. If you ever had one of those nights, Vivaldi, how could you? Right. Um, I'm going to. I need Vivaldi. <laughs> I, I'm now running on YouTube with no way of stopping it. It's like a runaway car, isn't it? Right, so I'm, I'm trying to get Vivaldi back. So let's get Vivaldi over there. Because I had heaven knows how many windows open. Oh, do open them all. Because my YouTube was in one. Oh, I said, what's it done with my YouTube? Oh, it's thinking about it. Right, okay. I think it's loading in. I can bring it back. It'll get 
What are you doing? It'll get there in the end. No, oh, it's gone back the other way. Don't be silly. Right. And there's me recommending Vivaldi, crying out loud. And you can see how long it's taking to go. But well, here we go. Right, let's get back where we were. All I was trying to do was put a page in. Right. Uh, and that, you're thinking about that. Come. I did say before we started, though, didn't I, that Notion was having a moment tonight in nowhere. I'm going to pension you off and start chat GPT if you don't behave. Right, page. Where on earth are you going to put that now? Come on. Gosh, it's slow. It's not normally this slow and it doesn't normally crash. Right, so there's my page. You can see you can create an empty page. You can add new content that's Notion based or you can start writing with chat AI. So I'm going to type in, hopefully paste in. Are you actually going to paste that or are you going to insist that I type it? Oh, you annoying little thing. Right. Please write an Easter reflection for a church newsletter. Like I said, um, oh, and was it 400 words? Write a 400 words. There you see, it's picked it up from what I had before, but there you go. Now, it won't be the same. So if you don't like the first one, just ask it to rewrite it and keep going. So that was a reflection. I then decided I wanted to include the meaning of Easter. Um, so the prompt I put in to get it to write the meaning of Easter was a 400 word article on the meaning of Easter, which it then did. And I like that as well. I was convinced it, it would not be able to write prayers or nothing that you'd want to read out. It did marvellously well. So when we write prayers, we tend to write six verses of them. And um, we don't say, well, what's the last line? Let's pray to the Lord. What was our last line? We don't use that line, but I, I wasn't concerned. Uh, I also wouldn't want them numbered, but those were what it wrote. So again, technically speaking, depending on the mood it's in, let's try it on this page. If I copy that prompt, so the trick is knowing what prompt to put in. But if I add another page, the reason that I'm not doing it on the same page is Notion AI reads the page that you're on. So if you've got something that's nearly right, you just want it to rewrite it, just ask it to rewrite it. But I've copied that prompt. So if I go into there and I paste that prompt, only this time, let's say I want eight verses. We do six, but Others may do more. Plus the fact you could ask for 10 and then dump the four you don't like. Oh, isn't this? <laughs> I've, I've got a sneaking suspicion this isn't quite how you're supposed to do this. But honestly, if you're in charge of the newsletter and you've not got the bidding prayers, you haven't got the time. So let the AI take the strain. Steve, Stephen's not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no one can hear you, Mike, because the microphone's off. I'll turn it on and say that again. Stephen says no in... In chat GPT, writing the gospel reflection. <laughs> ah, but you see, if it's, if it's that or nothing, then that's what you go for. Trust me. I'm I'm talking here where the parish secretary is left to put the content in. And, and trust me, that, that is a common occurrence. Um, and it just puts stress on that person. So I think as something, I mean, I can look at some of these and think, no, definitely not. No. Um, but I, I look at others and think that's beautifully worded. So and sometimes if I think no, then I will think, oh, yes, but that's what I want to write about. But I don't want to say it in that way. I want to say it in this way. So I'm not suggesting for one minute that you just copy and paste these in. I am for demo purposes, <laughs> but I don't suggest that you do that. No, uh, that one there. Let me see. Um, sick and suffering, those who have died, families and love. That one. Oh, it does. It's at number seven. Um, this is one that I always would forget to put in at Easter. The Easter vigil on a Saturday night is when those um entering the church you know being baptized etc um join the church so it's nice that they're mentioned in the bidding prayers and i would forget that i know i would forget that so it's sometimes nice to have like a prompt but then write your own because that's what i would do with chat gpt i wouldn't ever copy and paste something out of it on mass but i would use it for ideas 
But I'm saying if you are responsible, like a parish secretary, for generating the newsletter and your celebrant is sick or whatever, and it all falls on you, you've got the reflection to write, you've got the bidding prayers to write, you've got the rest of it, you can't do everything. You can't do everything. So start with a prompt. Let's say that. Start with a prompt. So let's go back here. Uh, those were the bidding prayers that I was using, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was actually the bidding prayers I was going to put in on that page. So I'm going to use the reflection, this 400 one here, while Stephen <laughs> gets very giddy. But I'm just going to use that. Not my job to write them. That's not my job. I'm laying them out. So uh, on this page here, this double page spread, we can see that bit there. Uh, that's that one, isn't it? So that's actually my reflection because I'm using this. So my bidding prayers are going to go on this page here. So I'm going to put in a place for those bidding prayers to live in there and paste them in. Now, first thing you see when you paste them in, you've got all of this. This is not right, but this is because this is just the format that comes out of Notion. But trust me, it's easier than the format that comes out of uh, Outlook. OK, right. We have them in there. Uh, this is not formatted text at the moment. This is not formatted. So if we look in the text styles at the bottom, you've got no style paragraph and no style character. I also need at the top of that bidding prayers. Right now, with the bidding prayers, I need to put the bidding prayers. I need a heading style for the bidding prayers. So a heading one is probably a good idea for that. And it's always a good idea, even if this text is exactly what you want. It's always a good idea to format it anyway. And I would format that as body. And you should have noticed one thing happened, which was it twanged upwards uh, and it's taking less space. And that's because I've not got a full 12 points after each paragraph. I've got six. And this is what I'm saying if it doesn't fit the page. This is the time that you can stretch it out a bit by narrowing it down. Most of the time I end up trying to extend it um, where I've got text in there and it's not formatted correctly. When I format it correctly and I put the six space after, um, it shoots off and then I need another page and I can't have another page. It's got to divide by four. So this is when I would start expanding it. So that's why I've built it that way. That if we have little text, we're OK. If we have a lot of text, we're still OK. You built in the flexibility. So let's leave it about there, shall we say. And I then put some graphics in. So the graphics that I'm using are. Um, let's have a look at them bidding prayers here. I will show you. Um, I would do where they disappeared to. Were you one? Yes, you were. So I've got a collection of um, images that are SVG and they are vector based, which means I can bring them on and I can scale them to whatever size I want and they're not going to pixelate. So what I wanted to do with something like that was like have it at the bottom. Now, obviously, it's far too big. Uh, but I'm looking at the text, I'm thinking about the width and I'm thinking, right, so just as an example, I can show you that I can widen that, which means I've got much less text intruding on this image at the bottom. Obviously, I can move the image down at the minute I'm working with the text, but I could move the image down. But I have to think about page numbers. So I don't particularly want the image potentially obscuring the page numbers. But this is my image here. So if I go into this and I do that, you can see the text pushes to the bottom, but that's not really great either. So if I set that to tight, it starts flowing around the cross. Not bad, but it's too tight on the right hand side. But you can change the distance from the text. So if you push it that far, it starts to look quite strange, but that's not bad. That's not bad. I can live with that. OK. Right, so we got our bidding prayers. The other thing I had was the reflection, which was going on this page. So I've got the space for it and I'm putting in here reflection. 
And I have the reflection because Notion wrote one for me. Oh, that was the reflection. That's the text for the reflection, not the bidding prayers. <gasps> Good grief, woman. Right, I'll go and get the, the bidding prayers and I'll switch them over. This is because Vivaldi crashed. Right, bidding prayers. Open up the bidding prayers, but these aren't bidding prayers. Come on. Right, this is my reflection. Did nobody notice? <laughs> right, let's take that out of there. We'll put that in here. So I'm just going to show you in here as well. If this was in multiple columns, you'd potentially have a problem with that heading. So that heading, I am going to make a heading one and it centers it across there. If I decided, though, that I thought this reflection would be easier to read in two columns, life won't end well. So let's go and add another column to it. The reflection heading doesn't stretch across it. It still doesn't in version two. There's no option. There is an InDesign that isn't an Affinity Publisher. The workaround is to take the word reflection out of this text frame and use a separate text frame above it. That's that's the only solution at the moment. I don't think that needs to be in two columns because then I'd have to balance the columns and I'm not doing all of that. So uh, that's the reflection text, which means that, well, I'll put my bidding prayers in here, never mind. So what I do with that is take this down left to right. So it almost fills the page and I would probably put some kind of image at the bottom. So that is it done there. Right. Then I need the text of the bidding prayers. So let's go in there. And I said with the bidding prayers, I'm going to have two problems copying these bidding prayers. So my problems are notion generated problems. Problems you will probably encounter is the double spaces and things like that copying from other places. So my problem with this, and I'm going to put it in as plain text, is that they're numbered and they shouldn't be numbered. So I need to manually get rid of the numbers. Uh, interestingly, I don't have the problem with the extra spacing when when I bring in numbers or bullets. It's just paragraphs of text it seems to dislike. So let's get rid of those numbers. Although I have known people read them out twice or miss one. And gone, went too far. There it is. And there are my bidding prayers. So again, because what I was doing with that was narrowing it down and just getting it to wrap around there a bit like that. And I'll probably change that. that. That's not bad. In fact, no, I would need it more than one line. We'd need at least two lines like that. So we've now got con content in. Right. Next thing we to show is this sidebar. I decided to do this white on black because I wanted when people open the newsletter to see this sidebar and know that it was important. Um, it's got the contact information on it. So I started by drawing this on. And again, this is why I have this set to three columns. So I know that that is give or take the, the right third of the page. I simply filled it with black and then added a text frame to it. And I didn't make the text frame touch it on the right hand side. I wanted it to be halfway. So really, I'm, I'm like creating like an internal margin here. I didn't want the text up to there because it would look strange. But so that was about perfect for me there. But I'd have to be very careful that I've got text up to this left hand side that may not print. So you would have to check if it printed or not. If not, you would need to narrow it down a bit. Uh, the text I had in there, so let's go in and have a look at that text, was the, just the contact details. So I am going to copy that from there. Let's see how that goes. I should probably save this file, shouldn't I, given what's happened so far. So uh, let's save that as well. OTN on the night, so I know it was done live. Right, I wouldn't have that going to the bottom. I would probably take that about halfway. And then I'm looking to paste that text in it. So if I just paste in as plain text, all kinds of stuff is happening yet again, isn't it? I'm not seeing it properly. Something is not working right. Um, but technically, if I copy it in from here, it should work. Don't you love it? Let's click in it. What on earth? Where? Why are you there? Are you? Oh, it is there. 
there it is. Um, yes, that's not good, is it? Right, let's move it over there so we can actually see it. Right, what I was going to show you was when you paste it in again, it, it's used the last style that I was using, which is not correct, correct at all. But I have in here, I've got my base group, my cover group and my sidebar group. So in the sidebar, I have a dedicated H1, which is this one here. That needs to be a H1, but it needs to be the sidebar H1, which makes it white. This one is the address, which I had as just plain text, which again is making it white and so forth. So, so we can work with this it would probably be better at the moment to uh, let's make that bright red. Now we can see everything. Right. And then what I've got over here, you can see in my sidebar, I've got links. I've got next week's readings and I've got plain text. So I've got the five styles that I need to style this. Using this style, you can't even see it all. So that bit there was email. I think I had that down as links. This one, well, you were heading to. You were. Right. So the website needs to be a heading to. And the URL, again, is a link. So that's going to be a link style. Right. That's the top half of that. Obviously, we've got far too much space in here. I'm going to get rid of that. We don't need that. Uh, we don't need that. I would probably put a little bit more space in than that. So maybe like that. And then I would scoot this up because I'm going to put a graphic in. So if we look at what we've got in here, we had a nice graphic in the middle, which I have a copy of that I can put in our file. And then we've got the next week's readings that's in there. So while I'm in here, I might as well copy this. What are you doing? Right, let's copy that and go into that. So I need the graphic. So I'm going to bring the graphic in. This is one of the icons. It came from Envato Elements. And if you don't drop it on, on the document itself, which I don't want to half the time because it'll probably go wrong, it opens in a window of its own. If you want it to open in here, you actually have to drop it on the canvas. So take that and put that underneath there probably needs to be a bit smaller. You really are making a drama out of selecting anything at the minute. OK, we'll do it by the layers. That's what you want. OK, right. So this was further over there, wasn't it? It was centred with that one behind it, which is there ish. That one needs to be centered with that. And then finally, there would be a block at the bottom, which again is just a text block. I would want it to match the other one in terms of width. So let's take that and get that centered. There we go. And paste the text in. And there is next week's readings. Last thing I need to do with that is to take this background and make it black instead of red. You are thinking about it, aren't you? Whoa, this is slow. Even telling me it's black and it's not black. Mm. Shall we pretend that's black or shall we try and force it? <laughs> Never had so much trouble with it, obviously, because I'm broadcasting live. Nothing. This is not usual. Let's go and get some colours from in here. No, nope, you're not even doing that, are you? OK, whatever. We'll leave it red then. Right. So that is how I would create stuff. But I, as I say, I wouldn't copy and paste from the AI. What I would do with the AI is take it as inspiration. But if you know, it's five minutes before showtime and you've not got anything, then it's a starting point, isn't it? Do we have any more questions? We don't have any more questions. No. Has Stephen recovered yet or is he still in the faint? <laughs> OK, let's get back in here then. So the next thing is content. Hopefully you will have some content from those supposedly supposed to provide it. Um, this kind of content is content in terms of stories that you need to get out. So requests for people to support projects, stuff like that. 
So it's not the standard here are the prayers and here's the reflection and here's this and here's that. This is the actual content that will change on a week by week basis. There's a couple of ways to do it. I will show you the way that I do it. So um, we would have in here, we will be starting at my layout is slightly different than this. But on this side, I would start with the stories. Now we have two parishes. So the heading that I put at the top is going to be parish news, which is for all parishes. So it actually says on it all parishes. So that's things like um, if the priest is going on holiday, if there's changes globally. So not restricted to one church. Then we have the first church and the, all the news from there. And then we have news from the second church. Most people don't need to do that. So I'm just going to do this in terms of we'll just do it simply. But I will add in a text frame. And again, I would put that heading at the top. So if you look at what we've actually got in the demo file here, where our news is starting over here, we've got parish news and then we've got stories. And so I'm going to go back and copy the text later. But at the moment, I'm going to put in parish news. That again is going to be a big heading, so a heading one. And then I'm going to put the text in. So where have you disappeared to now? Right. So I'm going to go back to the other one and just copy this text. This is just plain text. I'm going to paste it in as plain text as well. So I think I can do that, but I don't want the parish news at the top. Right. But I'm going to paste it in and show you how the text styles work. So let's paste it in as plain text. And obviously it's it's using this last style that I used thing, which we don't want. Oh, have you made the body that for some reason? I have no idea what you're doing. You're making it a heading. Let's make the whole thing a body. Now, this one is the heading one. So even if you're pasting it in as plain text, you can put that in. No, that's the sidebar one. We don't want the sidebar. We want that one. This one is a heading two. So we'll make that a heading two. Now, there is a line under it. That is not an underline. The reason that I have done that, it needed some delineation. That, that was a feedback that we got. You know, you, it, they like it clear as to what is what with the stories, that, that they're switching from one story to another story. We tried underlining it. The problem with the underline, it looks different in different fonts and some, some looks better in one font than another. So it's not an underline. What it is, if we go into the heading definition, is right down at the bottom, you have decoration. So I have enabled decoration. I have decoration one, which is a line underneath it. And it's set to one point. And that's it. Now, what you can do with that is you could set that in different places. And so I've got it at the bottom. If you wanted one at the top, you could put one at the top as well. And if you wanted to move it, because that's far too close, you could move it. That moves it down. You can put negatives in to move it the other way. So if you did want to delineate it with two lines, that's more printer toner, just saying, um, you can do that. We decided we would put it underneath like an underline, but we retained the option to be able to move it. So an underline would look more like that. We pushed it away, but you could push it away even more if you wanted. So that's why we use a decoration rather than anything else. It kind of sits outside the text. The descenders like the J don't cut through it. So that's why we decided to go that way. And all you need to do is go through here and apply that story wherever you need it. So heading two, that should not break there, obviously. OK, right. Then I've got more stories in there than you could actually see in here at the moment. So I would need to go onto another page and I would need to add another frame and then go back in here. And it, you're indicated in here that you've got more text with the eyeball and the triangle. Clicking on the triangle makes that blue and allows you to navigate to another page and click to add the text in there. We still have more text. So I can put another one in here and do the same again, link that one to that one. And there's just one line at the end, which obviously would need sorting out. But there will be more of it because I would need to go through here and apply heading twos 
to these stories like this. Literally just clicking on it. Uh, heading two, not a one. Right. So now we've got some content in there as well. Uh, simple as that. Now, you may, depending if you're taking adverts, need to put advert content in here and have this text wrap around that. In those circumstances, you might want to put these stories in as individual blocks. We don't need to do that. That's just something you might need to think about. Something to consider. Right, we got any questions on that? Only from Simon. And gone. Who would like to know if, as an atheist, he can still use these techniques? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I did say, I don't, I'm not sure if I put it in the blurb, but I did say in the email that I sent out that, you know, a lot of these techniques are just that. They're, they're just techniques. Um, they work for any kind of newsletter. There's some specifics like, I mean, even the bidding prayers aren't specific, are they? But I guess the front cover, the front cover's specific uh, and the, the mass table at the back, which is the bane of my life. Uh, but apart from that, you're probably good to go with anything. OK, so a table of contents versus a selective table of contents. I've done a whole session on table of contents. I forgot to put the link in, Mike, but sure, you can find it. Um, you can get as detailed as you like with the table of contents. I'm not going to be explaining the table of contents in detail, but what I will be showing you is how to make a selective table of contents, which is very relevant for this kind of thing. So let's go back into here. I cannot make that black. I have no idea what it's doing. You know, as soon as I finish, you'd be like, oh, of course, that's why. But never mind. Let's just save it and live with it red. Right. OK, so um, a table of contents. Right. So on this page, I would probably have something at the top. To be honest, this reflection would work well at the top because if I made it, uh, let's have a look at about the width. Uh, oh, no, maybe not. It wouldn't. No, that is not going to give us enough room at the bottom. So I would probably put something up there that's a bit shorter. This is moving in slow motion. Right. So for a table of contents, what I need to do, I need somewhere to put the table of contents. So I'm going to use this and do that. I only want the table of contents to look like that. I only want to highlight specifics in here. I don't particularly want to highlight everything, because if you look at all these little itty bitty stories you've got about, you know, Joyce's coffee morning and all the rest of it, there's no point. They might as well just read it. So it's only specific things I want to put in here, but it is going to be my contents. Oh, have you done weirdy things there with that, even though I told you not to? Hmm, never mind. Right, we'll make that a heading one across the middle. Below that, I want my contents. So I'm going to make this a lot bigger than I need it because I'm going to need it a lot bigger to demonstrate it. To do that, I need to go to text and I need to go down to table of contents and insert a table of contents. Do not do this if you have not used styles to style your text, because if you haven't used styles, you're just going to get an empty table of contents and wonder why. So the first thing to know with tables of contents is that you need to use styles correctly for this to work. I've used the heading styles that were there so far. So I'm going to insert that table of contents and it's going to get everything in there. It also opens up my table of contents panel. Now the contents are on here, but if we look to see what's actually going on, you can see, good grief, we've got heading one, heading one sidebar, heading one TOC, heading two. So there's six headings being included in this. Is there? We don't have anything formatted with TOC, but we do have stuff formatted with sidebar. That is a heading one in the sidebar over here. It's not included. Why is it not included? It's not included because it appears in your document before the table of contents does. So if this table of contents was on the cover page, the contact details and the next week's readings would be shown. You can force it to include that with this option here. So there are three checkboxes underneath the look in and the middle one is include entries before the, the TOC. 
So put a tick in there and then you get everything else. So you've got the contact details, you've got the email, you've got the website, what's all that, what, what's going on? All of that is coming through. Now, in this circumstance, we don't want it. But if you do, then that is how you do it. We're looking to reduce the amount of entries in the table of contents, not extend it. And we don't need the contact details, definitely not. We may need the reflection in the bidding prayers. And you'll notice that I've put Lenten Project, Important Story and Important Story. Those are the only things I want in the table of contents. So these things here, I don't want how to get rid of them because they need to look right. But if we go to the pages, look at our stories. We have in here a Lenten Project up there as a heading two. But I have a style that I have created that is heading two. It looks identical. Can't tell the difference. But it's got TOC at the end, which means include this one in the table of contents. How I created that style was to duplicate heading two. Simple as that. That's why they're identical. That was quick and dirty. The right way to do it is to make the heading two a child of the heading two talk a child of the heading two. And that way, if you make any changes to the heading two, they'll ripple through. But that wasn't what I was showing you. I was showing you how to make a selective table of contents. So I kept it simple. So this Lenten project, I do want included. So instead of a heading one, I'm going to format it as a heading two TOC. This is another important story. So that is a heading to TOC. Moving through, there was one more, which was this one. So that's a heading to TOC. Right. If I now go back to my table of contents, nothing has changed. Not even if I update it. Prove the point. Nothing has changed. But things have changed. It means if I say don't include heading twos, the story elements here are all heading twos. They'll just disappear. So don't include the heading twos. Fabulous. We're getting somewhere. Um, I do want to include the reflection. I do want to include the bidding prayers, but I don't want to see the heading of Parish News. So what to do with that? Well, take away the heading one. That'll work. Mm, sort of. If you take away the heading one, being included in the table of contents, you lose the reflection and the bidding prayers. So in your reflection and bidding prayers, you need to go and style it with a heading one TOC. Let's move down to the other one, which is bidding prayers here. That one is a heading one TOC. Parish News is not. Go back up to here and update that. And you've now got the reflection back and the bidding prayers back and the important stories. So we would never highlight more than half a dozen, which is why you can get away with having that about that tall, about five centimetres. Now, what's the problem with that? Has anybody spotted the deliberate mistake so far? Let's see in the chat. Has anybody got a clue what's wrong? It's purely a practical thing, but trust me, someone will point it out to you. What's the point in having a table of contents when we have no page numbers? In an eight page newsletter, it could be argued you don't even need the table of contents. But once it gets to 24 pages, but we don't have any page numbers. So back to the pages and we need to think about what master pages we need. Now, I've kept it really simple so far. I could go into master A and I could add the page numbers. So very simple there. Put a place to put them and put in. Don't even think you need page, but we will. We don't want it that style. Uh, probably a body and even smaller than that. So if I make that about eight or nine and I would make a new style for it, which would be based on body. But this would be, I'll actually call it page number. I'd probably call it footer, to be honest, but it'll do. And I would probably want that different in terms of I would want it right aligned in this circumstance over there. Now, I still haven't got at this stage, back you come, still haven't got the page number, but I've got the word page, so I'm getting there. Put the space in, 
and go and insert it. So from here, I am inserting a field and I want a page number. It comes through on the master as a hash. That will automatically update on the actual page itself. Right, so what I need to do with that in there is actually edit the name of that page number because this one is going to be to the right and I'm going to need another one for the left. This is how you duplicate it. Just duplicate it. You get a copy. You can see it's still based on body, but this time I want this to the left. And the change I need to make is in here where I don't want the alignment to the right. I want it aligned to the left. Right now I'm good to go. So what I need to do, easiest thing to do is to copy that. Didn't copy it fast enough, did I? Let's move it down a bit as well. A little bit close to the text for my liking. And it doesn't need to be that tall. Oh, why aren't you shrinking? Crying out loud. Right, that'll do nicely. At that point, copying it over to there. Probably looks like it's working brilliantly to you. I can assure you it's twanging around like crazy. Right, let's left align that one and we should be good to go. So if I go into here, you can see we do have our page numbers. Now, this is where this page here, you're not going to see it. It's there, but it's behind the red box that should be black that's arguing. And you're not probably going to want it on the last page unless you want to add mass times to the table of contents, in which case you do want it on the last page. Right. So far, so good. Um, the table of contents. Uh, that's dealt with. The mass times table in here that is the bane of my life is complicated for us because we have two parishes. Right. When it comes to working with this, it's just a quick hack. You can turn it round so it's at 90 degrees, but the page isn't wide enough to show it. So then I can't see if I've got any odd text, etc. So the little hack for that is draw out a box Obviously, something that colour, absolutely useless, but any other colour will do nicely. And put that behind the table while you work with it. Why are you not working? Honestly. That usually goes behind it. I swear this worked yesterday. It sat behind it. It was grey. Not quite that grey, but it was grey and it sat behind it and let me see all the text. Today, mm, not having it. Mm. Anyway, this is what you do with it. We've got two churches, so we put the services or the days down the left hand side and then the times. And then we have who were including for, for prayers in here or an indication that there's no service. Sometimes this will say it's a requiem mass. Sometimes it'll be a wedding. Sometimes they'll, it'll say school service. What makes it complicated is we then need to extend it to church two and include the masses for church two. You see, church two just doesn't get it. It's nowhere near the size of the main parish. Hence, there being two parishes glued together. But that is what you need. So I'm going to re recreate that, but I'm going to make it simpler by only including one parish. Forgive me, I haven't got all night. So and what I would need to do in here. I happen to know that I need a table and it would be three columns. So one's the date, one's the time, one's the service. And we actually had 16 because it was Easter. So 16 rows. So that's giving me there an indication, three columns, 16 rows. At that point, it needs to be the right size. So for that, I need to flip it round and just stretch it out. So literally move it and stretch it. Not adding anything to it, just stretching it out. Then, make it easy for me, I need to rotate it back. Shall we see if my trick's working? Because it was before. Oh, and it's red as well. Oh, well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. There you see, it's working now. I'm not lying to you. It's working now. <laughs> right, I will turn that off, though, so we're not bombarded. Oh, I see. Is that what's wrong with it? Right. Um, 
going into preview mode is cutting off anything that's overhanging. So I can't go into preview mode and do this. But what I do want to do with it is let's go back and have a look at this one. Look at the top. We have mass times at the top and then we have at the church and then the date. So we've got weird things going on here. So I'm going to make a note. That, in fact, I know what I'll do with it. I will do this with it. So what I'm doing is I am drawing around it with an app called Screen Float. And that way I can put it on another screen and refer to it. So there's a practical use for Screen Float. Do you want to put the link in for that, Mike? Right. So I'm going to go back into here, remembering I'm only doing it for one church. The first one probably needs to be narrower there. So let's say no. You are doing it, but never mind. Right. Uh, probably about there. And the next one is only the time. So obviously I've got much more scope here to put text in. I can make the text a little bit bigger because I've only got the one parish that I'm putting in. Issue being, this is really bad in red, isn't it? See if we can get it white. We're done with it. Excellent. Right. So this first one says mass and service times. So I need to merge the cells and that's what this button here does. So if you've used Excel, you know what merge cells is. It just merges those cells. So when I type in them and I'm putting mass and service times. I can center it across the entire table. Now, remember earlier, probably not, but we'll bring it back. I said, uh, where, where have you disappeared to? You're in there. I know you are. Right. Now drag that on. I'm in a table. I don't want this text going crazy. So I'm going to choose to ignore the baseline grid for the entire table. So that's a practical case of when you use that. So taking that off. And I could format that, I think, as a heading one. That might actually look all right. If not, we can have it as a heading two. Oh, that looks fine. Right. So the first one had that. And then this just said church one. So actually we could do we could do away with that one. We wouldn't need to put the church name in. Uh, but the next one is the is the date. So the 8th to the 9th of April. So again, that would I would merge it together. I would put the date in. So. 8th to 9th. Uh, did I say August? I'm losing the plot. It's April. Wishing my life away. Right. Put that in there again. That needs centering. Um, at this point, I'm looking at the whole thing and thinking, yeah, then everything needs centering by clicking that, which moves it to the middle vertically. This one would be far better. I'm quite happy with the font. So up to here and going to favorites and choosing Trajan, but it would make more sense with the background of that cell for it to be darker. And I did that with the purple, I think, like that, and then changed the text to white. Over we go, like that. I don't think I had it quite that purple, but there's the idea. And then in here, I put in the services. So the first one was the East Vigil. If you are not of a church going persuasion, the Easter Vigil was about three hours, three and a half Something hours. Something like that. Oh, it's a long one. It's a long one. And there's no breaks either. <laughs> there is a comfort break. Although we do go outside with candles, so you just pray it doesn't rain. It's um, like having extra time and penalties and is. more penalties. It is. Yeah. There was one year, and this is a true story. There is one year we went to the third parish that we used to have, which is really close to us. It's like 500 yards away. And it's next door to a school. The school is part of the church and the police were called. And if you're wondering why, it was because somebody in the houses nearby saw the clergy come out in white robes with candles and thought it was some kind of cult. So the police dropped up to the service. <laughs> true story. Absolutely true story. All right. And if I could spell Easter, we'd be doing well. Right. So I put that in there. Then I put the times in. Uh, it has to start after dark as well. So if you've got insult to injury, you're not getting back home till way after 11. Uh, that one was 9.30, which is our standard mass. And that one is 5, which is the afternoon mass. Right. And again, you've got that problem that everything in a table is too close to the edge. So 
I would select everything here because that's where my other masses would go. And I would use the table panel in the cell where the default is 0.4. I would up that to at least two and it indents it neatly. That is actually the eighth and ninth. Um, they just didn't have the dates on. So this row would also need to be uh, cells merged, background colour put on, text in, only it's not the 8th to the 9th, it's the 10th to the 14th. So 10th, oh dear. Let's undo that and put it in the other side. Don't overwrite it like that, let that be a lesson. Right, over here. I'm going to add it before the eight and then delete the eight. Otherwise you lose it. And 14th, I think. And then you're ready to put more in. So this would be Monday the 10th, Tuesday the 11th and so forth. So I won't make you sit through all of that, but that's how you do it. Uh, then, so let's go and get that. Didn't really want to put a V in there, but never mind. Right, so we've got this table that I can rotate back. And I thought we had that printed the other way, but now I've looked at it, I don't think we do. I think that's the way we have it printed. And that is how you do that. OK, we've got any questions on that before we head um, on to the last bit? No, but Sarah did make a comment mm -hmm. regarding the text box colour. She has this issue sometimes, creates a new text box with the correct colour pre-selected, and it seems to then create the correct coloured text box from the start. Yeah, I, I think it's just Affinity Publisher 2, you know, it's still quite new. I mean, that red thing's ridiculous. Um, the other one was me. You know, I'd forgotten that I'd turned on preview mode and preview crops anything that's off the canvas. Um, but no, there are a few issues with it. I mean, it actually crashed on me twice. There were bad words last night, wasn't there? Mm. Um, while I was in the middle of, of creating the first, you know, the one the one we're referring to, the demo file. Um, obviously, it'll improve as it goes. But that's just what we've got at the moment. And yes, there are a few quirky things in there. Right. OK, so I think we've got everything there. What we now need to think about is the output or the export in terms of what you're doing with it. So this is not the time to be planning that. This is the time to be executing that. The planning needed to be in the pre-production phase because all that you've done up to now may be for naught if you come to output it, then you find that things won't work. But I will show you two different options and a trick with the Mac. So uh, I'm, I think I'll do it with the other one because we know that this is this one's actually working and things are the right colour. And if I turn this round, I'd be in the right place as well, wouldn't it? Actually, no, it's not. It's moved. Playing with my mind. Right. There we go. So we can get rid of that white box. And I do think that one is then ready to go. Um, the only thing I did extra was the coffee morning on it, which was just, you know, more of the same. But that is our document and it is ready to go. So the majority of churches tend to actually print them, but don't send them to print. So the first thing is, if you are sending, if you, if you are using an internal printer for this, you can just... Command and P and actually print it. So the printer that we have, we actually would be bought another one. Uh, yeah, we only need to print twice a year and it, the last one broke. So we've got a new one. It's a brother and it's a, a black and white toner thing. It's not a colour printer. So the preview over here is showing you what that would actually look like. Um, you can hide the details. You can go in and change all of this. But that is showing you what that would look like if it was printed to that printer. So in terms of having to change the colour of images to get it to print out correctly in grayscale, I've never found the need. Your mileage may vary, but I've never found the need. Um, I can't give you much advice in terms of settings in here because they are different depending on what printer you have. So I think we've got a couple, haven't we? And some weirdies. Mm. Um, these are virtual printers, but these two, that, that's our old printer, RIP, and that's the new one. And what you see in the print dialog depends on what printer you have selected. So in here, I have range and scale, document layout, bleed and marks. I've got all of these, but these are determined by my printer driver. So when I'm actually physically at the church, 
I've got a million more options because this thing has got nine paper trays. It prints out in all the colours, in all the sizes. It's absolutely amazing. Um, the most stunning thing with the printer in the church is I can air print to it from my iPad, <laughs> which, which trust me, it's overkill, but it, it never gets old. So what you will actually see in here depends on that. Um, I will. Uh, mine can print two sided. So that's one thing that I could do with it. But if you're actually printing it as a magazine, as a newsletter, you will probably have the folding and the stapling and all of that set up as well. So I can't really do much more than that other than show you that if your printer is black and white or you choose to print in black and white, it will come out in a grayscale. So that's the print option. You do have a couple of other options. So if you're making a PDF, need to think of exporting it. So the export is file export. I've got PDF set as a default at the top. And in here, this is where you choose. So if you want to take them out as PNGs or JPEGs so you can put them on the website and people can view them as images, you could do that. Um, we don't have the option in here. I know I'm still waiting as well, but we don't have the option in here to produce an ebook. So we couldn't make an EPUB and distribute that. It's got to be for digital distribution a PDF. Mine is permanently set to PDF. That's pretty much all I would export as. The include, uh, my, the top is set for print. So in here, before we go through all the options, you've got file settings and then you've got advanced. And in here, you've got presets. So you will see in there, preset for print, press ready, digital small, digital high, all the rest of it. I've got two specials at the bottom. One is for when I produce something that Manchester United are going to print. And the other is lead magnets where I have a certain size and DPI and stuff going on. So when I do one of my guides to whatever secrets, I use that one. Your biggest decision here is, do you actually want to print the PDF? Are you creating a PDF to print? Or are you creating a PDF for digital distribution? Now, why would you be making a PDF to print when you could print just using the print command? Well, the reason is it could well be that Affinity Publisher and your printer don't talk to each other or not effectively anyway, in which case you could create a file for print and then open it either in Preview or Adobe Acrobat or any other PDF reader where the PDF reader and the printer are on good terms. So in that circumstance, you would then create a PDF and use that to print. If you do create a PDF for print, it's going to be in colour. So don't expect it to be grayscale. It will be colour. Right. Press ready is like print, but better quality. So same circumstance with that. Unless you're sending it out to print, I don't think you'd be using that. So that leaves you digital. You need to choose digital if it's a digital output you want, rather than choose the print option. And the reason is, if you've got links in your file, the PDF for print will rip them out, obviously, because you can't click a piece of paper. The digital options in here will leave them in place. So my sending to United, when we, we send them two copies, we send them a copy to print and we send them a copy to put on the website. The copy that goes to print, if I was to choose this one, would take out the links. The other option I've got is to send it for digital high quality, which I use, and that leaves the links in. So when people download it from the website, they can print it if they want, but the links work. The links do not work in print or press ready. That's the biggest difference between them. So if we're making this for digital output, I would go for digital high quality. Then you've got what you want to send. Now, again, this is going to depend on how your printer works. If I'm sending this, what I do is say pages, all pages. Now, why not spreads? Most people are consuming on a phone, which is vertical. If I make them scroll left to right, they get very grumpy. Even with an iPad, if they open it up, they tend to open it up vertical. And again, you would have to scroll. 
they get grumpy. So I choose pages, not spreads. Then you've got your advanced options with what's supported and what's not supported. And what you see in here depends on what you've selected at the top. So this is for digital distribution. So if we go down there, that's where you see include the hyperlinks, include bookmarks, uh, include everything, really. <laughs> You're not including printers, marks, etc., because it's not going to print. But what you see below depends on what you select in the first option. If you change any of this and you find yourself changing it every week, you don't want to inadvertently one week make a mistake. So the best thing you can do is make a preset. Now, the reason that it's dimmed out is because I've not changed anything. But if I just changed one thing in here, you can see now up here there is no preset. And when I go into here, I can create a preset based on the changes that I've made. So I would suggest you create a preset. Once you've done your trial and error and you work out what works, what works for you, then create a preset. Right. At that point, you can export. So I'm going back to digital high quality over here and I'm going to export it. And I'm going to stick it on the desktop. Another issue with this is it seems to take forever to generate a preview and the older version didn't. But we will export this. We will put it on the desktop. Right, I am going to put on so I know which is which because I've got a dozen of these. Right, on the desktop. And then I'll open that. That will open in Adobe Acrobat, but I'm going to open it in preview. So there's the file. I am going to do an open with and choose preview. And we can see what we've got, which hopefully is a fine file. So let's stick that in the middle. Uh, can we make this where we can see a page? Give or take. Right. So as we go through this, we can also see that these are links. So again, if somebody's looking at it on a phone, they can tap a link and it'll take them to that story. Uh, here's the thing where we had it running around. There's the stories. There's the coffee morning. And there is this. One thing I do with a digital distribution is flip that round. So in Acrobat, I don't know if I can do it in here. I've no idea if I can do it because I don't use it. <laughs> but in Acrobat, I can flip that round. Um, if people turn their phone round, which is the, the first thing they try and do, it flips round and then they end up trying to chase their own tail. So I would personally flip that round. Uh, I will show you how I do that. Now, I know Acrobat is a paid for thing, but I'm pretty confident um, PDF Expert can also flip a page around. Not that that's cheap. Are you thinking of opening and would that be any time today? There we go. Right. So what I do in here, you can see all of this has come through as well. So everything we've got under there. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it, you know, it's organized pages, isn't it? It looks like Fisher Price has designed this interface, and I'll be honest with you, I absolutely loathe it. But I'm persevering with it. Right. So what I would do is I would flip that round. The other pages stay the same. And then all I need to do is to close that. And you see, that's much easier for me to read. Right. Uh, do I want to save the changes? Yes, I do. So let's save that. Get it back open again. So I'm going to show you the last trick. So. This is just something that you can do on the Mac in preview. I believe you can do it in Acrobat um, in terms of making it grayscale. But preview, because it's made by Apple, has got a few tricks up its sleeve. So if I've got this and it works best on where there's a picture, if I've got this and I go into file, I could choose to print it if I wanted to print it from here. I just show you that last page is the right way round. So that's that's best practice if you're doing it digital. But in here, if you don't go to file and print, if you go to file export, you can get to export this. So let's get the page up right in a different format. So you can export it as pay, as graphics or whatever. That's not what we're doing. We want it to be a PDF, but we have quartz filters and quartz filters will enable you to make it black and white a blue tone, um, a generic PDFX document, grey tone. You can increase the lightness or decrease the lightness, reduce the file size or set it as sepia. 
Sepia and blue are quite interesting for church newsletters. So if I do a, let's save it out as sepia and tag on the end sepia, it will create another version on our desktop that's sepia. If I do the same again, so back to export, down to quartz filters and choose blue and put blue at the end. There we go. And the last one that it had was the grey one. So I'm going back to export. I will show you these. Obviously, I'm just going through the process three times. Uh, that one is grey. So in there and a grey tone. They've spelt it the American way, but never mind. Right. So what have we got in here? The top one is the one that we're looking at. This one. Oh, it's going to open the acrobat. Oh, I should have opened it in here, but never mind. There is the sepia one. So all of the graphics are on our coffee page are sepia, which could be a nice effect if you wanted to do that. Right. And we've got the blue <coughs> one and the grey one. So I'll open those up, then take that full screen and show you those. So there's the grayscale one. And there is the blue one, which, again, quite a nice look. If you're looking for something like that, it's a, it's a cool way of doing it. That I don't know. I, I know Windows does not have quartz filters because they are Apple. But I don't know if there is a way on Windows to do that. If you do know, then leave a comment in the description, in the chat. Under, well, in the chat, if you're live, um, in a comment, if you're not, let me know. I, I would I would love to know. Um, I don't know if Ac Acrobat could do it because, as I've said, I don't like the interface of Acrobat. I'm only using it because PDF Expert is hideously expensive and I've already got a subscription, so I might as well use Acrobat. But there you have it. So uh, let's head back into here and see how recap. Have we done everything? I'm sure we have. Right. We had pre-production considerations and how to start strong with your presets. Um, then you've got grids, guidelines and the baseline grid. The master pages versus the content pages. So you saw me edit the master page to add the page number, um, mainly because the table of contents makes no sense if you don't do that. Then creating a cover. So where to get your stock imagery from and what information legally needs to be there. We added content. We cheated, I know, but we were using it for inspiration. So we get a buy on that. Plus the fact the Catholic Church can always go and confess, can't you? So I confess that I have used AI to generate ideas, but only ideas. Uh, then you've got the general content, which was the, the little stories. And then you've got the table of contents versus a selective table of contents. That selective table of contents trick you can use in many different ways. There's nothing to stop you having three tables of contents or four. And each one has different information in it because you decide you filter out the styles you don't want to be included. And then in the final output, we've got output to print and all the considerations that you need there and exporting to PDF and making some changes. So there we have it. We will be going into Q&A in a moment. But um, at the moment, I'm doing some YouTube shorts and they're all about Affinity Publisher. To say it was a challenge was an understatement. Um, it, you, it's got to be less than a minute. So what value can I provide in a minute? Let me know. If there's something that you want to know that you can think I can cover in one minute, let me know, because usually it's about 90 or, or 120, isn't it? Oh, 120 shorts. Just imagine that. But that is what I'm doing at the moment for the next 30 days. So you will find those at twitter.com slash Elaine Giles. But you will also find the shorts on YouTube. Um, the idea of a short is that one, it's short and two, it looks grand on a phone. So they are vertical as well, which is proving to be quite challenging when the application is not. But uh, if you if you watch it, let me know what you think. All of the stuff that I do is available on demand at youtube.com slash Elaine Giles. There is an All Things Affinity playlist, which includes every session I have ever done on any and all of the Affinity apps. If you are only interested in Affinity Publisher, then I have a separate playlist for that, which is the Affinity Publisher playlist. That does at the moment include the short. Uh, well, shorts, there'll be, there'll be more. I can't stop at one, can I? If you would like that in a separate playlist, let me know. At the moment, it's in that playlist. And I don't know what happens when you finish watching that one, whether it takes you out to another short of somebody else's or whether it takes you to the next video in the playlist. I haven't got that far. Right. Don't forget to subscribe. That way you won't miss anything that's coming up and hit that notification bell. And then you definitely won't miss anything that's coming up.
Thank you for being with us. I hope you have enjoyed it and found it useful. If you have, don't forget there is that like button underneath that you can hit completely free of charge. There is also the super thanks if you are feeling flush. And there is my newsletter at elainegiles.com slash VIP where you will get first notification of everything that is coming up. And we'll head into Q&A. So do we have any other questions? We do. We have two questions. OK, where we go. We have one from War, mm -hmm. which says, is it possible to force a page end before the word at the base of page five? Yes, it is. Um, so that would be in the style. Um, you would edit the style to make sure that it, it keeps with next. So let's go into here. Let's get rid of all of this. I didn't bother with that, but yes, you can do that. So let's go into here. You do it in more than one place as well. Right. So let's get some text. It wasn't that one, was it? That one, that one worked beautifully. It's tonight. It was playing with my mind. Um, I think it was this one. So this this here, which is the heading, you would tell that to keep with next. And what would happen is it would get to the end. It would see that it's not with the next. There's no other text underneath it. And it would force that onto the next page, which is here. So that the word story would then be linked in with this here, which it is not at the moment. So that's one way. The other thing that you're talking about is if there's one word left over. But that one there, which one is it? That is the heading two. So somewhere in here, let's see if we can find it. Keep with next, keep with next. There's so many options in here. I don't think it's spacing, is it? Oh, I can never find it. They, sh they should put a search on here. There's a good idea. Um, it should be position, shouldn't it? Positions and transforms. Any Anybody got a clue? Oh, I've probably set this up ages ago. It's in here somewhere. Do we have keep with next? Oh, when I see it, I'll be like, oh, of course, of course it's there. It's one of these. I think it's in here. Left indent, right indent, space before, space after. This one is one that um, I usually end up changing. It's in here somewhere. Is it the flow? Yay, keep with next. There we go. So what you would say with that is keep with the next number of lines. So at the moment it says no change and that means zero. If I wanted to keep it with one line, which would do, then I've changed that. It's disappeared because it's pushed it to the next page. So that is now glued to that line. In fact, it's always going to be glued to that line. So if we go down to this story and we put that in and do that, that word story would have stayed in there. You can see how much that gap is. But because I've told it to glue it with the next one line, that's what it does. And you could have that set to as many lines as you want. So if you don't really want it to be just one line, um, you could have it set to two or three, whatever makes sense to you. But yes, you can do that. Does that answer that question? Right. What we got now? Uh, Stephen's question from earlier about the circles at the corner or X's. Right. OK. Let's go in and have a look at that. So uh, what's happening with that one is um, let's go into here. Let's delete this. Let's delete some text out of this. And that will give me a blank page and I can show you what would happen. Right. So that's pulling itself back up there, which leaves me with this page here, which has a frame on it. There is a text frame on there. You can see it. Right. When you've got a text frame, is it a text frame that he's talking about or a shape? When is it real? Um, uh, amend items placed on pages which have specific masters containing frames. So frames, I think. Right. OK. Um, I've got this on here. So this is on the actual page and I can do whatever I like to that. OK. But if my frame is not on there, if my frame is on a master, so I'm going to just make another master. So I've got a B master. If my text frame is on here, then you are quite right. So I'll put one on either side. And there it is. If I do that and then apply that, 
to this page here, then it should come through and it should have crosses on it like that. Right. If you go to your layers panel, you can see that you have the content. So master A is applying to the left hand side. So let's ignore that. This is the content that's over there, that text frame. We're going to ignore that as well. This here is the frame and you can put text in it. So you could in there put some filler text in. Uh, where's our filler text? Insert filler text. So you can put text in. One of these days it'll put the right style in, won't it? Right. So there's the filler text. You, could, you can put text in it. But in terms of editing it, you're right. It's locked. You couldn't move it. But in the layers, you have the master B there, which is the right hand page. You can open that and then you've got your frame text and then you've got the actual text inside your frame. And these things can be edited. So if you go into there. And where on earth is it? Oh, it's disappeared again. Never find that. Do we have to do it on that bit there? We do. Right. So in here, you are able to edit frame content. But if you want to edit the look of it just for this page, you need to edit it detached. And at that point, you get this or this bar at the top, the green bar. In version one, the bar is orange, but in two, it's green. And now you do not have the crosses, which means that you can make changes to this or do whatever you want. You do when you finish have to click finish to come out of it. But that is how you edit it. So you actually go to the master itself, right click on the master and choose edit detached. You don't choose edit linked. If you choose edit linked, you're changing it for every page. But edit detached will do that for you. So hopefully that answers that question. What else have we got? From Peter, how do you handle incoming content? A lot of the content sent to me typed in email, which I copy and paste into Affinity Publisher. Do you have a more efficient way of doing this? Uh, well, yes, I suppose, because what I find is when the text comes in, it has been copied and pasted out of emails. So there's there's errors which, you know, you can give somebody a style guide till you're blue in the face and you're still not going to get back what you want. That's the thing with the multiple spaces. But I find stuff that's pasted from email has these strange characters in. So my first job when, when it comes in is to copy the text into a text editor and just run a clean up on it. Now, if you've got a text editor like BB Edit, now I don't use BB Edit for this job, but I could do. If you've got something like BB Edit, you can create a script and you can do searches for, for multiple characters and get rid of them. You can do searches for characters that you know you're never going to want and get rid of those. I find it just as fast to paste it into Sublime Text and then do a find and replace on it. Um, you can make multiple selections. So if you've got like this weird character, how a weird character appears is it's in angle brackets and it's got like AX069. And then the next one's got angle brackets AX047. I've no idea what they are, but they're causing havoc in the layout. So once you've generated a list of those, you could just search and replace, search and replace. It takes me maybe 15, 20 seconds per text file. And then what I do with it, um, I mean, you could you could put it in Notion, you could put it in some kind of database. What I find works well is just having a tag in drafts for the next newsletter. And I just put, you know, next newsletter, paste it in. And then when I've got more text, I create another note and I tag it next newsletter, paste it in. When I've used that text, I just change it to like archive. And that that serves me well, but it's nothing fancy um, because the problems are always different. You can't predict the problems. And if you can't predict the problems, it's quite difficult to predict the solution. But that, that's what I do. I mean, the thing like the double the double spaces drives me insane. It doesn't matter how many times you explain, <laughs> you still get it back. Um, but that's easy to fix. That is predictable and it's easy to fix. It's the stuff that you get, weird characters from email. And, and particularly if somebody's hit reply and then that's been sent on. And then the text that, that needs to go in the newsletter has got the angle brackets in it, indicating that it's a quote or it's a reply. And then you've got to take all of those out. So it's you, you could make a script. 
but I don't think you'd ever get to the end of making that script. So really learn, if you learn the find and replace options in your text editor really well, you can do it like that. I mean, I can search and um, regex as well, which we're going to look at in an upcoming after hours. Um, regex can help you a lot with that. But other than that, it's pretty manual, I'm afraid. What else have we got? That's it. OK. So anybody get any any blinding lights of things that you're going to do in the future with your newsletter? <laughs> maybe we'll tempt Stephen over to the getting inspiration from AI route. Oh, and on the other hand, maybe not. <laughs> I think I've seen situations where I've seen people, you know, have been promised all sorts of articles on something and, and it's just it doesn't it doesn't come. You no person can do both jobs, certainly not at the same time. And yet you're expected to. So we have a tag team going on. Um, my, my as I say, my part of it was twofold, um, top and tailed with mine. I created the template. I created the styles. Um, I created assets and I created a video to show the parish secretary how to use it all. When she's on holiday and she comes back, she then watches that video again and gets up to speed with it. The second part of my role is when the newsletter is finished in the parish secretary's mind, it comes down to me and then I do like the proofread on it. And I do take text out at that stage if necessary and run it through a text editor. You do get weird stuff. Weird, weird stuff. I don't think there's a way around that from an email client. It depends on the email client. I like to work with plain text a lot. So I have in Raycast a shortcut that will paste plain text. So I copy text that has styles in it. But when I paste it, I paste it without the styles. And then I go through and I style it. Um, just, just the way it is. Just the way it is. And, and the things that you see, it's like every week that there's something new to trip you up. But that's just the way it is. OK. Any more comments? No. I'm, I'm trying to zoom in there. Wasn't it good that everything crashed? Not. I'm going to work out, you know, why that wouldn't change from red. But, you know, it could have been worse. Oh, Peter's not had any issues with weird characters. I definitely have lots and lots in there. Um... I don't leave it. Well, I can't leave it in Affinity Publisher because it, it's in uh, Microsoft Publisher at the moment, unfortunately. It does have a find and replace, so I can find and replace two full stops. Another thing that I get a lot is space, full stop, space. So it's as though somebody's been told to put a space before the full stop and they do the same before a comma, which again, but that's predictable. So I use the search and replace within Microsoft Publisher to do that. And yes, I could do that in Affinity Publisher. It, wouldn't it be great if, if they added the ability to have macros in Affinity Publisher? Um, because then you could string them together and, and run it as like a single command. I'm sure the day will come. That's where if, um, Adobe InDesign is. It, it has the edge with um, regex. It's regex is amazing. It's got conditional search and replace. So I'm hoping that they will add that. I know there is basic regex in there. We're not quite there yet, but I think it's probably something that's coming. So pretty, pretty well. Oh, Peter gets that as well. No, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> Do you know, I, I, it's like mm, once it's happened like 27 times, you're like, is it too late to mention it? Should I put a style guide out? And then you do and it's ignored. I, I've got this idea of the style guide lining the, the cat's litter tray because the next week it's like, I'm, I'm there. Oh, it'd be good. It'd be good. It'd be good. Oh, oh, it's the same, is it? OK. <laughs> just the way it is. That's just what you've got to do. OK, well, it's now what? Nine minutes past 11 and somebody's got, got um, a ship 30 to write. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll, I'll be writing that and publishing that. I might have to try another video tomorrow, one of my shorts. But what I'm writing about today is what I wish I'd known before I created the first short, which is all of the stuff that I didn't have that I needed, all of that. So have, have a look at that. It'll be on Twitter. Uh, and I will see you all again uh, on Friday for After Hours, if you are with us on Friday for After Hours. And if you are not with us for, on Friday for After Hours, why not? We have a great time. Um, what, what are we doing? I've no idea yet. You know, it's Monday and Friday's a long time away, but I'm sure it'll be entertaining. I know there'll be some obsidian because we've still not gotten to mobile with that. Um, but in the meantime, if you've got any questions, put them in the comments or contact me.
I'd love to hear from you. But for the moment, I'm going to say good night from me. And good night from me. And we will both see you next time. Stay safe, guys.